70. 85. This climb has just been absolutely brutal. It's the third major climb. There's your buckle. Well, we get two? Are you yes. serious? Yeah. Oh, Congratulations. You make it out. Welcome to Run Free and Strong. I'm Reiko. Is it possible to race faster by training slower? There are hundreds of articles, books, and YouTube videos proclaiming that it is possible to race faster by training slower. According to these sources, low heart rate training or methotone training develops the heart and improves running performance. Do you think this is true or false? Do you think it's possible to race faster by training slower? Let's look at the science to answer this question. This question has been answered since the 1950s with respected scientific research. But the question doesn't go away. The British Journal of Sports Medicine published a blog post authored by Sergei Rusikow in October of 2023 entitled, The Air of Easy Running in Terms of Stroke Volume Response to Exercise, or Why Peter Coe Was Right. In his video, I will synthesize the blog post in a manner that I hope will be easy to consume and understand and let you conclude whether or not this miracle is too good to be true. Let's dive right in. We will start with the hypothesis that heart stroke volume improves with exercise and improved heart stroke volume translates to improved heart contractility. It will be important to understand heart contractility. It's simply the heart muscle's ability to contract. Now that we've defined the hypothesis, let's put a little heart rate training in a historical context because it's not new. In fact, low heart rate training originates in the 1930s. Arthur Lydiard, who coached multiple Olympians, popularized long, slow distance running or LSD in the 1970s. His concept was high mileage training with a mix of intervals and LSD. In the 1980s, Dr. Philip Maffetone popularized Low heart rate training with the MAP method, which recommends a train at a heart rate of 180 beats per minute minus our age. If our hypothesis was true, it would mean that fairly easy running would be a good developer of the heart muscle. Although it doesn't feel like we're working hard, our heart is working hard. Therefore, no point in further increasing the load. One can benefit from this training effect without further effort. We can literally race faster by training slower. Many runners believe this hypothesis is true and therefore it influences their training. As we remember from our high school or university science classes, we must test our hypothesis to prove it's true. First, let's look at the recumbent position. Scientific research concludes that Venice return is not limited by gravity. Heart chambers fill quickly and stretch to the maximum. The more it is stretched, the longer it contracts. This is similar to a balloon. However, this does not train the heart. Second, let's look at the upright position. Research concludes that gravity limits venous return. In an upright position, blood is distributed to the lower extremities and abdomen, which decreases the force of contraction, stroke volume, and cardiac output. Stroke volume decreases 10 to 30%. Stroke volume achieves a maximum at less than 60% of VO2 max or 100 to 110 beats per minute heart rate. The scientific research concludes that the low heart rate increase in stroke volume is restorative and reflexive and not associated with increased myocardial contractility. We would achieve the same outcome by training while lying down and with less effort. Therefore, we are unable to prove that our hypothesis is true and let's find out why. Let's find out what's wrong with our hypothesis. Stroke volume does not identify myocardial contractility. Although they're related, they're not equivalent. There's a related misunderstanding that exercise increases stroke volume. Let me pause there. Exercise does increase cardiac output, which is a product of a heart rate and a stroke volume, but it's driven by heart rate and not stroke volume. In fact, the pattern of stroke volume response to exercise has not been established. There are three patterns to consider. Ascending when stroke volume increases as load increases up to VO2 max. Horizontal when stroke volume does not change in the recumbent position at 40 to 50% of VO2 max. Ascending when stroke volume decreases in the recumbent position 
or after recovering in the upright position. We need to adjust our hypothesis. Let's learn what determines heart contractility, if not stroke volume. We should define stroke volume as a difference between the end diastolic volume, in other words, before contraction, and the end systolic volume with maximum contraction. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that the heart pumps with each stroke. We're gonna get a little bit scientific and complicated here, but this is important to understand. The ratio of stroke volume to EDV is the ejection fraction, which determines myocardial contractility, not stroke volume. Put more simply, this is the percentage pumped out of left ventricle with each heartbeat. Let me repeat that. It's the percentage pumped, not the volume pumped. What happens above 60% of VO2 max? Cardiac output increases due to the further increase in heart rate and enforced heart contractions. In other words, an increase in ejection fraction. As the heart rate increases, the cardiac cycle shortens and therefore the diastole or the chamber relaxes, shortens faster than the systole or the chamber contracts. Research concludes that the ratio of diastole to systole reverses at higher heart rates and is dependent on cardiorespiratory fitness. In healthy men and women, the ratio remains above one. Therefore, our new revised hypothesis should be the pattern of stroke volume response to exercise depends on cardiorespiratory fitness, primarily VO2 max. All three patterns should occur depending on myocardial contractility or cardiorespiratory fitness. Number one, with high myocardial contractility found in athletes, stroke volume increases. Number two, in normal myocardial contractility, stroke volume remains constant. And number three, with myocardial weakness, stroke volume decreases. Scientific research and data supports this hypothesis, which is included in the British Journal of Sports Medicine blog post, and therefore proves the hypothesis is true. Therefore, we conclude the following. The effect of slow running is not associated with training myocardial contractility, and the pattern of stroke volume versus exercise depends on physical fitness and or myocardial contractility. The force of myocardial contraction increases with increased load. The result of an increase in ejection fraction and not always an increase in stroke volume. The latter is an indirect measure of myocardial contractility. We can conclude that the concept of easy running to train heart stroke volume assumes a training effect where there is none and misses it where it actually exists. Having said that does not mean that low heart rate training does not have any benefits. There are benefits to low heart rate training. It builds basic endurance and enables higher volume of training, or what many runners refer to as building the aerobic base. It improves capillarization, strengthens muscles, bones, joints, and ligaments, and improves brain and fatigue resistance. However, the bottom line is you have to train fast to race fast. Let the debate begin. Please leave me a comment below. Does the science make sense? Do you train primarily in zone two or do you train across the five energy zones? Thank you very much for watching. If you found the video useful, I would appreciate it if you would give it a big thumbs up, smash that like button. If you're not already following my UTMB training journey, I would appreciate if you consider subscribing to our channel See you in the next one.